On October the 14th, 1947, a bright orange Bell X-1 research aircraft was released from the Bombay of a B-29 mothership high over the Mojave Desert. The pilot, Charles E. Chuck Yeager, immediately lit all four chambers of the X-1's rocket engine, sending the tiny bullet-shaped craft rocketing into the stratosphere. Less than a minute later, a sonic boom rolled across the desert floor like thunder. At an altitude of 13,000 meters, Jaeger had reached a speed of 1,100 kilometers an hour, becoming the first man to exceed the speed of sound in level flight. This record-breaking flight catapulted Jaeger into legends and earned the X-1 pride of place in aviation history. But had history played out just a little bit differently, the first man to go supersonic might not have been an American, but a Briton, thanks to a hyper-advanced but ill-fated aircraft called the Miles M-52. This is the story of the long-forgotten transatlantic race to break the sound barrier. In October 1943, the British government issued Air Ministry Specification E-2443, which called for the development of an aircraft capable of flying at over 1,600 kilometers in level flight and climbing to 11,000 meters in 1.5 minutes. Given the embryonic state of high-speed aerodynamics at that time, these specifications were extraordinarily ambitious. However, military intelligence reports revealed that the Germans had already flown an aircraft faster than 1,000 miles per hour. These reports likely referred to the October 2nd, 1941 flight of the Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet rocket-powered interceptor when test pilot Heinrich Heine Dittmar reached a speed of 1,003 km an hour. The Air Ministry simply confused kilometers per hour with miles per hour, giving the impression that the German aircraft had gone supersonic. Nonetheless, the Air Ministry soon awarded the development contract to Miles Aircraft Limited of Woodley in Berkshire. On the surface, the company was an odd choice to design such an advanced aircraft. Known for its conventional light training and transport aircraft, Miles had no experience with jet propulsion or high-speed aerodynamics. However, it already had a good working relationship with the Air Ministry, and in the end proved more than up to the challenge. Within a year, they'd come up with one of the most advanced aircraft designs of the 1940s, the M52. Measuring 10 meters long with a wingspan of 8 meters, as with the American X-1, the fuselage of the M52 was modeled on a rifle bullet as this shape was known to be stable at supersonic speeds. Unlike the rocket-propelled X-1, however, the M52 was powered by a Powerjet's W2700 turbojet, producing 8.9 kilonewtons of thrust and fitted with two unique modifications. The first was a reheat pipe, better known as an afterburner, a chamber aft of the engine exhaust into which fuel was injected to provide extra thrust. The second was an augmenter fan to drive extra air into the afterburner, a feature which made the engine the earliest example of the low-bypass turbofans ubiquitous in fighter aircraft today. While the X-1's propellant-hungry rocket engine meant it had to be dropped from a carrier aircraft, the M52 could take off and land normally from a regular runway, though normally was a relative term, as the aircraft's tiny wings gave it a terrifying high landing speed of 270 kilometers an hour. To reduce drag, the pilot sat in a conical plexiglass capsule mounted directly ahead of the engine, which in an emergency could be jettisoned with explosive bolts. A parachute would then deploy to stabilize and slow the capsule, allowing the pilot to open the canopy and bail out using his own chute. Cleverly, the cockpit also doubled as a shock cone for the engine intake. As jet engines cannot function while ingesting supersonic airflow, the incoming air must be slowed down. A shock cone accomplishes this by generating a shock wave, which causes the incoming airstream to decelerate from supersonic to subsonic speeds. While the M52's wings were not swept back, as in modern supersonic aircraft, they did feature an extremely thin cross-section and razor-sharp edges to delay the formation of shock waves. The wingtips were also clipped at an angle to fit within the shock wave generated by the nose cone, further reducing drag. The M52's greatest innovation, however, was its all-moving or flying tail. When an aircraft approaches the speed of sound, the center of pressure, the point on the wing through which the lift force acts, suddenly shifts rearward, causing the nose to pitch down in what pilots refer to as Mach Tuck. Unfortunately, at the same time, shock waves also form along the hinges of the aircraft's elevators, rendering them unresponsive. The result is a deadly dive, from which it's almost impossible to recover. Mars's solution to the problem was to make the entire horizontal stabilizer move as a unit, allowing the pilot to trim and maintain control of the aircraft through the transonic regime. To test the M52's wing design and all-moving tailplane, Mars modified one of its M3B Falcon 6 communications aircraft by moving the wing-mounted undercarriage to the fuselage and replacing the wings with thinner versions made of wood. The aircraft, nicknamed the Gillette Falcon due to its razor-sharp wings, first flew on August 11, 1944 and quickly validated the engineer's designs at low speeds. For high-speed testing, an all-moving tailplane was fitted to a supermarine Spitfire fighter aircraft, which in tests was flown by famous Navy test pilot Captain Eric Winkle Brown. 
By this time, 90% of the detailed design work had been completed, and the Americans, who were working on their own supersonic aircraft project, expressed interest in the M-52 program. According to Dennis Bancroft, Balz's chief aerodynamicist, the British agreed to share all their technical data, including the crucial design of the all-moving tailplane, on the agreement that the Americans would reciprocate. But soon after Mars handed over the findings, the Americans declared their own research top secret and refused to share any data. By February 1946, construction was well underway on the three M52 prototypes, with one being nearly 82% complete and expected to make its first flight within six to eight months. Then, suddenly, the British government announced the entire project had been cancelled. Though Sir Benjamin Lockspear, the Minister of Aircraft Production, officially cited doubts over pilot safety and the practicality of supersonic aircraft, in reality, the aircraft had simply been cancelled as a cost-saving measure by the new Labour government of Prime Minister Clement Attlee. Shocked by the decision, Mars lobbied the government to reconsider, but as the project was top secret and Mars could not draw upon public opinion, they were ultimately unsuccessful. It was not until September that the existence of the M52 was at last revealed to the British public, whose reaction to its cancellation was predictably outrage. Bowing to public pressure, the government reinstated the project, though not in the form of a manned aircraft, but rather one-third scale radio-guided models. Developed by Vickers Armstrong under the direction of engineer Barnes Wallace, designer of the bouncing bomb used in the famous Dam Busters raid of 1943, the models were powered by an Armstrong Siddeley beta rocket engine fueled by hydrogen peroxide and hydrazine, an air launch from the bomb bay of a modified de Havilland mosquito bomber. They were designed to crash land in the water and not be recovered, telemetry being transmitted throughout the flight to a receiving station in the Isles of Scilly. The first model was tested on October the 8th, 1947, but due to a flaw in the engine, it exploded shortly after launch. Six days later, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in the Bell X-1, which featured an all-moving tailplane likely copied from the M-52. A year later, the British tried again, and on October the 10th, 1948, the second rocket-powered model reached Mach 1.38, validating the M-52's aerodynamic design. But it was already too late. The British had already lost their lead in supersonic flight to the Americans. The first British aircraft to exceed the speed of sound was the de Havilland DH-108 Swallow, which accomplished the feat in a dive on September 6, 1948, with test pilot John Derry at the controls. Unfortunately, the Swallow proved a temperamental and dangerously unstable design. Three prototypes crashed during testing, killing pilots Geoffrey de Havilland Jr., squadron leader Stuart Muller Rowland, and squadron leader George E. C. Genders. Eight years later, on March 10, 1956, the sleek Fairy Delta II research aircraft reached a speed of 1,132 miles per hour, or 1,811 kilometers per hour, becoming the first aircraft to exceed 1,000 miles per hour in level flight and holding the world airspeed record for over a year. While certainly impressive, this accomplishment failed to capture the public's imagination like Chuck Yeager's historic 1947 flight, a feat which, had the British government been a little more far-sighted, might very well have been achieved over a year earlier by a British aircraft. Thank you for watching.